so Jonathan Lorimer says, what's your next project? Send you another book. And then says that was a joke. <laughs> uh, right now I'm, so just today, uh, Reed and I started thinking about um, tactics. Now that the Haskell language server is up and running uh, and looks amazing yep. you know, and is easy to install and just, it looks incredible. Um, Reed's been working on tactics for a long time. And I have always sort of been thinking about, uh, I think I got this idea from, from James, uh, Asian Ultra, mm -hmm. which is uh, to, to get programming to a, a place where we don't need to be at a keyboard to do it. <laughs> right. I, I would love to like just work out in the sun in the park on my notebook and like be able to produce Haskell programs that are executable and, and correct. Right. Interesting. Um, and so the, so I was tackling that sort of in the, in the form of an editor and like a, a programming editor. And the, the core insight for that was, you know, you have enough type information that the programs pretty much write themselves. If they're like, if the, if they're generic enough, right. They usually well, can well, do that. Well, or... I mean, at any given point in writing a program, there's only a few, a few options that you can do, right. You can say, I want to apply a function. In which mm -hmm. case, like, I can choose a function I want to apply. And that's okay. quite obvious to me at any given point, right? Um, or I might want to, like, introduce a lambda or, like, split a case expression. Mm -hmm. And that's, for the most part, it, right? Um, Fair enough. And so there's no reason that I can't just choose one of those alternatives. Oh, okay, rather kind of a clicky it. thing rather than typey thing. Yeah, exactly. So I, I was sort of imagining something with my stylus where I could say, like, uh, you know, um, this thing should be a homomorphism and Haskell will be smart enough to write the homomorphism for me, mm -hmm. right? I, I still need to drive, but I shouldn't need to be doing all the, like, all the actual... So not quite the Idris route where you, like, uh, write a very, very specific type and then the compiler figures out everything, but kind of slightly more human-assisted, I guess, right? Right. Well, so that's, I think, where Reed's work comes in more so. Because mm -hmm. uh, it's the same machinery. And in fact, all my stuff was just based on his library. Okay. Um, so he's a lot more interested in sort of um, adding a proper tactics engine mm -hmm. so that uh, you can um, just say, hey, like, here's how I would solve the problem and you just go and do it. And in time, you can sort of develop a library of ideas for how an implementation should look. And so you just choose the right way of imp implementing the library and, or implement the function and it'll do it for you. And so... Um, anyway, all of this is like, we started this a few hours ago, so <laughs> I'm not promising anything, <laughs> but I think it's a really cool idea. Uh, and I think it's probably the future of programming. And I suspect it would be a killer application for Haskell if we could pull it off. Yeah, for right? sure. Um, can you like, can you imagine a world in which like there was no typing involved to program, <laughs> right? You just, like, that that sounds so foreign it. to me that I can't, I'm not even sure I can imagine it, right? It's, Right, it's it's incredible. Like we um, spend so much time learning Vim key bindings and getting fast with editing too. code, which is like a terrible medium for code, to arguably. Yeah. But it, you, you, that's the way it, it works, right? Yeah, um, it's 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 amazing that I think we we represent code as bytes, right? Because <laughs> it's not. Yeah. There, we can represent it as bytes, but it's not bytes because there are infinite numbers of strings and a much smaller number of infinite programs. It's a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Like, I, at the very least, it should be at least an AST, right? Something that's yeah. at least parsable or makes sense to. Right. At any yeah. given point in time, there's only a few meaningful edits you can make. Mm -hmm. um, but text editors obscure that and let you make any possible edit. Yep. Most of which are not syntactically valid, let alone semantically valid. Uh, so that's one project I've been thinking about. And then the other one is um, there's a uh, Saba's work uh, is now on the whole program optimization mm -hmm. in GHC. And I've been looking at that and that thing will spit out um, all of the, the internal representations that GHC does. Okay. Uh, one of those is the STG pass, the, which is sort of Haskell's virtual machine that is imperative. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the point is we can extract those files, um, which means we can now write just a virtual machine in, a, in another language for that, for okay. that language, right? So, um, I, I don't think we're too far away from being able to, to run Haskell on Python or on Lua, uh, or sort of any other target with this machinery, right? 
uh, without all the work of needing to go to like GHCJS, where you need to fork the compiler mm -hmm. and then have two separate compilers and hope that they stay in sync, but they never do. Uh, I think this is probably a much easier way going forward to do that. Um, and I, I, I have no idea about the performance, but I, yeah. But I guess I would it would depend a lot on like the target language. That's like an, a lot of uh, details there, right? For, for the performance, yeah, it yeah. does sound very interesting. So my, my idea right now is just to write an interpreter. And so I spent um, a few hours the other day trying to write an STG interpreter in Lua. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out Lua is a terrible language. It was one of my first <laughs> languages. And I, at the time, I loved it. <laughs> oh, and now coming back to it, it's not, doesn't. And now coming back to it, just, it's, it's terrible. So I spent like <laughs> most, of, most of, I could probably put 12 hours into like, trying to re-implement enough of a type system that I trust the code I write in the future. Mm -hmm. And even getting that right was so hard. It's just, <laughs> oh, God. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's see, we have a few more questions in chat. So I wanted to add that uh, uh, that what was approachable about thinking with type is that it wasn't mathematically heavy in all its explanations, which made it a very readable, uh, very readable as a mere mortal like myself. Yep. yep. That's definitely Thanks. appreciated. Yeah, cool. And that's how I feel uh, as well, right? Like, whenever I go into a, a heavy math book, I, I have no idea what it's talking about. And I really <laughs> don't want to sit down with, for 20 minutes and trying to parse these things. Oh, yeah, it kind of like you get extra homework when you get that, right? Because then you have to look yeah. things up. You need to look, read papers. And then maybe the, yeah. those papers that have references that you need to read. And it it's, it's, seems like it's going to take a, like a, a huge toll, right? I'm sure that you get a better understanding mm -hmm. of it like that. But I would like to know what it is I'm investing in before I put in the effort. Fair enough. Right? And so I think this is a better approach for, for motivating things before you're forced to learn the, the details. Um, then Jonathan says, I think Connor McBride said that we should be inferring programs from, from types rather than types from programs. Yep. That's also, I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what... Uh, oh, oh, God, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Um, the Idris creator... Oh, I'm uh, feeling them. Yeah, Edinburgh. Yeah, exactly. Because like uh, that's kind of the title of his book, right? <laughs> type different design, right? Where, where you write the, the the types first, and then uh, you can also write the code. But uh, look, with the Idris too, he's also trying to derive a lot of the code, especially when you have linear types and so on. You can he can derive. He's shown that he can derive a lot of interesting or cool functions mm -hmm. using just uh, just from the types. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so Agent Ultra said that to be super dope. <laughs> People are complaining that uh, about the uh, V muscle memory that's going to be useless. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm in the same boat, right? Like I've put hundreds of hours into my Vim config. Yeah. Uh, and it, at some point, it sort of feels like it's too much to waste. But then at the same time, my Vim doesn't have good language service support. And when I try NeoVim, I don't understand it. Because <laughs> my config doesn't work for whatever reason. I don't know. Uh, just the other day I told VS Code and like the, it just worked out of the box the language server and I was like oh no. I mean I hate, I hate that it's not Vim but I gotta admit that's a nice experience <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I, I, I for some reason I was lucky enough to I started my Vim experience with NeoVim so things work pretty decently for me but right. yeah it's still um, so the future is installing random editor plugins into your cortical implant that's a sad <laughs> okay I think we're a bit of, like we have a few years until that happens. <laughs> I mean, Elon seems uh, to be working on it, so. <laughs> uh, so let's see. I'm so glad I spent little time getting better at writing code. Uh, now I know I won't need to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so regarding AST editors versus text editors, I've always found that AST style, style thinking is very limiting because I have to make only valid changes, whereas that's not true when with text editors. It feels like it's really convenient. Have you given much thought about to that? Yeah, um, that's an interesting point, I think, but um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. That's not a thing I run into. Uh, and maybe that's me, I don't know, like uh, the, my, my current workflow is I always have a REPL open. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd say like every time I save the file, I reload the REPL and run what I'm working on. And that breaks immediately if you are working on things that aren't syntactically valid. Um, so, so that's not really my workflow. Um, and but at the same time, I'm not suggesting, at least I'm not working on removing that right now, right? 
what we want to do is add support for these things in traditional text editors, not create a whole new editor that doesn't support yeah, exactly. text editing. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I guess that was a thing I ran into in, um, when I was trying to make my own editor was like, especially do notation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of hard to figure out do notation because like, if you want, there's to so many variable, things you can do there, right? Yeah. There's, there's a lot of like sort of arbitrary rules, mm -hmm. um, that are syntactic more so than anything else. So yeah, trying, yeah. trying to work that out was challenging. That makes sense. But uh, I think that's a, that's a it's a reasonable argument against. Um, and I, I don't know, but I don't think we have enough AST editing things to have a good sense of that yet. Oh, yeah, for sure. And again, th th this thing of, oh, I, I, I feel like I would be constrained with an AST editor because I like to like break things a lot before things mm -hmm. compile. That might be a relic of get, being used to editing text, right? We might It might turn out that it's not actually as useful as you think it is. Uh, right. But again, we, we don't know, right? And until we have a good editor like AST editor, we, we really don't know what the experience is. Yeah. It's, it's pretty hard to imagine, I think, uh, at I, least for I me. I think so, yeah. Um, like I can, I can sort of feel like what the AST would be like, but uh, I mean, you can't really imagine it in any. Yeah, I, I mean, okay, I, I can get a vague idea of what it would be like, yeah. right? But like, how would it be like working on a real code base, writing code, right? right? We're doing like fourteen hours of work in it. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> like, would you even be more productive, or like? Yeah, yeah nobody, nobody knows. So um, let's just let's just build it and find out. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. That, that I'm sounds. Unemployed. I got nothing else to do. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, at the very least, it sounds like an interesting research project, yeah. and it might, it might turn out something super cool. Yeah, um, it might be useful, but <laughs> well, at the very least, you learn something from it. I'm sure. So, um, so there, I think dependent type languages would make deriving programs from types uh, would be easier. Yeah, for sure. Like Idris and already proven that, and. Uh, yeah, we, we've seen this already. I feel like Haskell could get pretty close. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the idea is that you can help them, right? Whenever the like Haskell types are not uh, specific enough, you could just have user interaction to help. Like, okay, I want to go this way, not that way, right? Yeah. In my in my prototype example of this, I had an implementation that it was like good. It was a good implementation. I mean, the implementation was crap, but it was a good it was good <laughs> features. Um, and so a lot of like. I don't know if you tried to write the, the continuation monad instances, but it's it's tricky. I did it like, on stream like a few weeks ago. <laughs> right. I mean, it's doable, but it requires a lot of thinking and like mm -hmm. binding variables and just thinking really hard, right? Yep. yep. Um, and whenever I go to implement it, it takes me a few minutes. It took me a lot and, longer than that the first time, but right. sure. Yeah, the first time. And But I, I this is my go-to example now, right? Of like, <laughs> this is a... Okay. So, so it got to the point where you press A in my editor and it would fill in that type completely mm -hmm. from just having bound the variables, uh, right? And cool. like, th th that's a, such a nice experience because, you know, um, it's it's a hard thing to write. And, but that being said, there's there's two implementations that type check, mm -hmm. and one of them is wrong. And so, but yeah, one of them's an empty array, it. and you don't want that. You don't care. <laughs> you want to use your right. inputs, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, another case I really uh, was grooving on was a lot of times you'll have like like if you write a function instance, right? Mm -hmm. um, most of the work of the function is like case matching, and then you f map on the same thing. So you mm -hmm. like unpack the thing and you build the exact same thing, but with f applied mm -hmm. somewhere. Yep. Right. Um, and that that pattern happens everywhere in Haskell. Mm -hmm. And so like, why the hell do I have to write that? <laughs> Right? Why the hell do I have yeah, to do that? Fair enough. It's so much work, especially for big data types. Yeah. It's a sure. huge amount of work. And like driving functor helps in that case, but it doesn't help if you want to write the semi-group instance, right? Um, or you know, whatever. So uh, so that one, we, we added a tactic for that. And so you, uh, you'd say press the homomorphism button and it would it would unpack your thing and then rebuild it again and put holes in, in the only place that would be required. Okay. And often that was enough to, to implement the entire thing for free. Cool. That, that sounds super cool. Yeah. So hoping to have something to show off uh, probably by the end of next week. But I mean, again, no promises. <laughs> okay. So give me a bit of time because it seems like the chat's blowing up a bit. Or maybe I'm just... <laughs> uh, so dependent type, okay, we've already done that. Uh, dependent type would be make it easier. Uh, maybe now that Liquid Haskell can be added as a plugin. Cool. Oh, yeah. Maybe Liquid Haskell could help with that. Um, like getting better types and... Liquid Haskell. <laughs> 
It, it sounds cool. Uh, I've never tried it. Yeah, I never tried it either, but I kind of read a bit about it, and uh, yeah, it sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, I sort of feel like Haskellers have too much um, too much enthusiasm <laughs> for crazy <laughs> ideas. You know, that's it's like I still don't really understand Haskell. And oh I yeah. Was like, oh, but let's do Idris and let's do uh, uh, Liquid Haskell. So I I'm still working on this one. <laughs> I don't I don't understand this yet. And you're trying to throw more at me. Like <laughs> I still understand the urge, but I don't. Uh, it's hard for me to connect with that. Well, I, I think Liquid Haskell is something that's a lot more useful when you're actually writing application code because yeah. uh, you, you have a lot of invariants that you'd like to have in your code that are pretty specific. Uh, mm-hmm. In library code, it sounds like you, you'd rather use generic parameters, right, to make sure that your um, yeah code is simple. But it, like in application, I think that's probably that's one of the reasons why. Uh... Oh, so let's see, I'm tempted to take it for a spin on my stream at some point. I'm not sure if... Uh... I want to do proofs with the uh, lean TLA plus or lean liquid Haskell. That's agent ultra. Okay, cool. Yeah, that sounds uh, that, that definitely sounds interesting. Um, so let's see any other questions. Oh, are you still involved in the Polysemi project? No, I'm not. Um, I I got so burnt out on thinking about effects. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like I lived and ate and breathed effects for the better part of a year. Uh, and I was like 14 hour days of, of not only struggling with technical problems, but also dealing with uh, what, it, what felt like quite a toxic community at the time. Uh, anytime you mentioned free monads, people would say, oh, they're too slow. Oh, they'll never work. Oh, boy. Um, it, oh, oh, you're lying about your performance, which turned out to be true. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, sure, but then it took somebody like it took uh, Alexis uh, like a lot of work to to prove that you're yeah. lying and to to figure it out and to build her proposal and so on. Like it's uh, all all the haters that were, were were doing all that, they had no no reason to to say that, right? <laughs> that's all. Yeah, that's sort of my my thing. It's like nobody noticed MTL is not nearly as fast as it says it is. <laughs> nobody nobody noticed that, right? Yeah. Which means probably it doesn't really matter because. You're always going to be bound by <laughs> more so than anything else, right? Um, so yeah, so that stuff was pretty exhausting. Um, and then there were some some sort of bureaucratic stuff that happened sort of on the sidelines as well, where it's just like I have no interest in dealing with this anymore. Uh, and it sort of come as well to my my new view is I think it's sort of a, too specialized a solution. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're neat. But whenever I was using Polysemy in my own projects, um, it sort of felt like the value add wasn't as much as it seemed like it should be. Okay. Yeah. So um, so these days I try to just avoid monads if possible. <laughs> that, that, that seems totally reasonable. <laughs> yeah. And it goes quite along. It's amazing how much work you can get done without, um, if you, uh, if you, uh, Matt Parsons has a great blog post on inverting your mocks. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, saying, like, anytime you do something in monadic code, just don't do it in monadic code and return <laughs> a value that describes what you would have done, right? Mm-hmm. Which is essentially free monads, but without the monad part. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's yeah. it's all the value I saw there of sort of decomposing your problem into into the actions and then being able to interpret those later. Okay. Yeah. So, that, that, yeah. that sounds like a very good... Uh... Okay, so we have a question that's getting plus one here. So how did you get to the point of sustaining your passion for FP without being employed? Uh, apparently, a lot of question, people are curious about that. Yeah, um, I worked at Google for a year before that, mm-hmm. before quitting. Um, and that is pretty good for your, your pockets. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then worked in Silicon Valley for another couple of years after that. And so I had a good amount of savings when I quit mm-hmm. work. And the, I was just living off savings. Um, just like burning money, but I realize my expenses aren't that big, right? Like I don't have a car. I'm not married. I don't have a house. I don't mm-hmm. have a child. Uh, and I don't like to, I don't like a lot of things, right? Like <laughs> I have most of the things I need. Uh, and so really my only expenses were rent and food. Okay. Uh, and, and it turns out like, I, I think especially in, in Silicon Valley, it's so easy to overestimate how much money you need. In, in life, mm-hmm. where everyone I knew in San Francisco was making like 250000 a year. And um, 
but you know, if you want to buy a house, it's five million, right? right? And so you're not even going to think about it till you're close to three million, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and these numbers are just preposterous compared to everywhere else in the world, yeah. right? Like when I went to Ottawa, which admittedly is not as much fun of a place, um, like everybody I knew there was living on minimum wage and they were doing just fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's an order of magnitude, if not two away, right? And in terms of cash. So I guess one order of magnitude, but so. <laughs> um, so, so the long answer, to, or the short answer to the question is I was living on savings. I had no plan, but I felt like I, I at the time, I think I had 10 years of runway. Mm-hmm. And my strategy was if I can't find a way to make money without being employed in 10 years, then I probably should just go get a job, right? Like I'm probably not as smart as I think <laughs> if I can't figure out something in 10 years. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, but the the first book was was amazing. It paid for probably my first two years. Oh, that's, that's yeah, that's profits awesome. on that. And so I think right now I'm I'm still net zero. I haven't made any money. I haven't lost any money in three years of being unemployed. Oh, I mean, th- that's amazing, right? Because <laughs> yeah, it's great. great. Like, uh, and I, I just released a book, so probably that number will go positive at some point. Hopefully, cool, cool. I I really hope it does. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Me too. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, life isn't worth working a job you hate, right? Mm-hmm. Unless yeah. you really have those bills you need to pay, um, it's it's usually quite easy uh, if you don't have dependents to, to restructure your life in a way that doesn't require those expenses. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not painful after the first week. Um, and so I would strongly encourage anyone who's, who sort of hates their job or um, doesn't like the grind or feels like the best of energy of their life is going to an employer that try it, right? Like what have you got to lose? You have a job now, you did it. If you need another job, I mean, software get one are, later, right? <laughs> it, it, it's easy to get employed as a software engineer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? If you're worth your salt, everybody wants to give you a job. And they're sending you emails saying, hey, we want to give you jobs. <laughs> or at the very least, find the job that makes you happier, right? Like, at the very least, like, if, you, if you're not having fun right now and you're doing the, the right yeah. and fun things, then, yeah, we, we can probably, like, it's not very hard to drive the market in a way where the where jobs are, right? It's really not. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I would strongly urge anyone who's sort of unhappy with their, with their current situation to, to just, I know it's scary as hell, but there's not really any risk. Well, so and again, try- sorry, Jonathan has a good point here. Some places are scarier to do that than, than others, right? Because for example, Canada has free healthcare, whereas in the US, you might be a bit scared to not have uh, employment. It might cost you a lot if you, if you get sick or something, right? So I mean, maybe, but I'm young. <laughs> right like young people don't need the health system and they're subsidizing the old people right yeah. uh, and so like I, I lived in the u.s for five years mm-hmm. and i had a medical plan the entire time i never i never needed it i never took it. even when i got hurt it was fine <laughs> um, so I, I think i think people might be too risk averse possibly uh, and I, I understand it i understand where that comes from but uh, it's worth considering that and like explicitly asking yourself what your risk portfolio looks like um, and is your investment in that risk uh, proportional to sort of the actual risk mm-hmm. yeah that makes sense and again as uh, again Jonathan has a good take here uh, he said I think Sandy's, Sandy's point is you could move somewhere that accommodates to live li- uh, living cheaply right or uh, like if, if you're scared about healthcare move somewhere where it's free right yeah, there's a absolutely. lot of great places with free healthcare I mean I moved to Lithuania where like I could live a day like it cost me 20 American dollars a day to live <laughs> including housing right uh, and then I moved to, to Thailand for six months and that was cheaper yep I mean it's if it's a little lonely absolutely Mm-hmm. But um, again, I think it's worth doing the math. Oh, co- Convince a few that. friends and move together. Yeah, even better. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> I've been uh, trying to move to Prague with a friend for like a decade, and he uh, <laughs> he keeps not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a great city. And, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay, uh, Czechs are asking, do you want to sustain yourself on books like a full-time author or until you run out of ideas? I don't know. I'm not, no sure I'm not i don't plan i just <laughs> it's just things just happen 
Um, I'm sort of burnt out on writing right now. I, I imagine there will be another book at some point. Mm -hmm. But you need I a break, like right? Have... You need to like, yeah. or at least until like something that you feel passionate about, uh, like you, you think about something that you feel strongly about, right? Or something right. like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I feel like I'm quite good at articulating ideas mm -hmm. and, you know, it's not usually the most eloquent, but um, I, oh, I, I, I think I've just been frustrated enough by like the overly formal academic stuff that um, I know how to, to translate that into human. So, yeah. um, so it, it feels like I have a bit of a comparative advantage here. And so I might as well take advantage of that while I can, but um, I have no plans right now. Okay, so it's relationships, relationships and community are hard to rebuild loneliness at big cost on your health. Yep, for sure. Um, I had big problems with loneliness and depression after moving to a new place. That's actually, yep, that's that's something that I was, Sandy was also saying. Like he, he moved out, right? He moved out of Lithuania because he, he just didn't get enough social interaction, right? So yeah, that's definitely uh, like just cheap living isn't enough usually, right? Or at least for some true. people, at least, right? I moved to Thailand um, after my PhD thing didn't work out, mm -hmm. and it was it was for mostly no reason other than I needed to make a decision for myself. Okay. Because um, like I'd, at that point I'd been on couches for four or six months or something, right? Like unbelievable, and it's just like always I was I was always on other people's schedule, and I was sort of waiting for other people. Um, and you know, fair enough, because I was sleeping on the couch mm -hmm. and for a lot of the time they were feeding me. Uh, it was amazing of them, but I got to the point where I needed to make a decision for myself. So mm -hmm. I moved to Thailand and I just found a beach somewhere and I settled down on the beach and I made friends with some of the local tourism people, mm -hmm. which was nice because they had an, a continual onslaught of, of like people, of tourists coming through. Mm -hmm. um, and I got the, like the remarkable chance to spend four months going out every night and meeting new people every night. Okay. Which, which really allowed me to sort of iterate on who I am, right? Because that means every night you get a chance to sort of highlight different aspects of your personality or see what things work and see which things don't work in social circumstances. And, uh, you know, being like the big nerd guy, I, I don't understand humans, <laughs> right? But it, it was so nice to get sort of this opportunity to just dive in and figure out who I am relative to strangers. Right. Um, which, what am I trying to articulate here? Um, I, I felt like I grew a lot during that process because I had always been quite, maybe not shy, but I had been, um, I was doubting of my social prowess. Mm -hmm. Right. And so just the, the exercise of going out and needing to meet people, it means you, you get quite good at it. Right. Cool. So it, it was lonely at first, but, that loneliness really strived me to, to get out and to meet people and to make it work. And on, on the flip, on the coming out of that, I'm so much more confident in myself and sort of powerful in social circumstances and just like capable of putting communities together. Um, so, Interesting. so I, I'd like to stress, I guess, the, the point I'm laboriously trying to get to is that's <laughs> a muscle in, in as much as anything else, right? Uh, uh, so just go out and try it. and it's scary as hell but again it's that's the, the risk portfolio mm -hmm. yeah for sure like I, well, again it's a bit harder to do nowadays with all the like distancing and the yeah makes it a bit harder right now <laughs> but yeah definitely one, one wants the craziness over like go to your local fp meetup start one if you don't have one yeah. like get people involved and if there's there's not enough people go to other languages and then like convert them right <laughs> it's i think chris penner is a good paragon of this um, i went to visit him in saskatoon where there isn't much of a haskell scene mm -hmm. or a ethnic scene at all but he would just go to the tech meetups and he'd just talk about haskell and he'd like <laughs> And he, you know, he wasn't a dick about it, which I think too often, I, I'm certainly culpable of this, right? Where <laughs> you, you need a, a Python developer, you're like, oh, you do Python? How, how do you manage? How? <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> the hardest thing in the world. You write this code? like. <laughs> uh, and so Chris is really good about not doing that. And, uh, and he, he'll go and he'll just, he'll just talk to people and sort of get a sense of where they are. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was just really, really impressed with Chris and his behavior and sort of how he was building tech friends who who didn't necessarily see eye to eye, but he could mm -hmm. still communicate with. 
which is the thing I've struggled with. Yeah, and also. it's also something that, that like you can learn a lot of things from people who aren't doing FP, right? Because they, yeah. they're doing some things in different ways. I mean, not, not going there every day, right? No, 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 not, not doing that. But like if you're caught into the Haskell bubble for too long, you, you kind of forget what, what the other side looks like, right? You sort of forget what real problems look like. I'll, yeah. I'll grant you that. Uh, so let's see. Oh, some there's some questions about the editor. I think you said that you're working on the AST editor thing, or not AST, but like tactics based editor to to plug it into the language server, right? The Haskell language server. Yeah. So it should be editor agnostic, right? It should work in any editor, hopefully. It should work anywhere. Yeah, that's that's the idea. Yeah. Um, 